So good afternoon, uh, 10 to 3, but we are going to speed up. I promise you that we will still be able to cover everything. We'd like to cover today especially a topic on automation and AI-driven capabilities to help you or your colleagues that are on the blue team side of the world in detecting cyber attacks in a network. And it's a hybrid network that means it's a physical network as well as the cloud components. So what I'd like to do is to give you quickly an idea about what Vectra is, because probably you have never heard about us. It's not a model of Opal. It's really def def definitely a cybersecurity tool. It's an AI-driven tool, but it's data science. I will really focus on that data science component in a minute. But if uh, all okay for you, let's have a quick intro. We're here also together with Access42, and they're using our technology really in their setup as well to protect and uh, secure their customers' environment. I'm Stan Romans. I'm responsible at Vectra for the system engineering team in North EMEA. And I've been working in network security for over 20 years now. I've spent time at Juniper Networks, at Palo Alto Networks, at Symantec, and now I'm already three years also at Vectra. And what we have seen actually over all of those years is uh, a lot of change, but at the same time, there was always one theme. And that theme is that when you look at cybersecurity and you translate that in a word, there's one word, it's more. More of everything, right? And that more of everything really goes on a lot of individual items, but it goes really on everything we, day, we take care of every day. So more attacks, more vectors, more vulnerabilities, more tools, more data, more alerts, more rules, but also a lot of more work because the persistency, the complexity of the attacks is not decreasing. So there's a lot of that that is continuously on the move as well. And there's one little thing that I also would like to add here, and that is that with all of that uh, search, with all that hunting, with all that uh, work, there's also a huge problem. And I'm not sure if you see that as well. And the reason I want to quickly add that is we had another session earlier this week where we had a questionnaire. I'm going to show you that questionnaire in a second. But we noticed that with all of that work and the pressure it brings to us to individu individually hunt, to look for tools that maybe you, you've been building yourself or that you've been colliding from different uh, sets into one, it is sometimes very, very difficult to find the real problem, right? Because all of those persistencies in, uh, in the network uh, by the attackers, they're using of the land, uh, so living of the land tools, they are hiding in plain sight, and that is making it so difficult. And we really, really see that our people, but also our customers' people, are really into that burnout. And we had this question really earlier this week on Thursday in a webinar, and everyone could vote. And the result of that vote was, when I asked a company, is your company taking care of mental well-being of your employees? And both sides, employees that potentially clicked, for instance, a phishing link or phishing email, and as such, kind of were the trigger to the start of a, of a, of a campaign or an attack. But also, do we take care of those that are helping out when there is an attack, right? That are doing those 24, 48, 72 hours in the beginning to try and find it. And what we found out is that actually a lot of companies are not taking that into account. And I think that was for me a wake-up call, because that is all related to all the individual work that we do where we're not automating as good as we can. And that is definitely one of the drivers of what Vectra is. Because the cornerstone of what we try to do is to look for the unknown. The known is quite well covered today. You have signature-driven solutions, you have your vulnerability assessments, you have your CVE repositories, you have your threat indicators, you have your threat feeds. All of that is very well maintained and is available freely and widely often and is being shared between a lot of companies. But the common theme today is that all of those existing vulnerabilities, of course, are covered, but a lot are not known. We have just had two weeks ago, I think, that huge problem with VMware ESXi where the patch was actually available for about two years, and still today we see a lot of problems because there's also that time pressure. It's also more, more of the CVEs and the patches to be deployed. So what we are trying to resolve is the challenge of the unknown, that existing TTP, for instance, or technique, but which is wrapped in a new paper. Because we all know it's not always the new wheel or the new wheel that is invented, right? A lot of those tools, the Mimikatsas of this world, the Cobalt Strikes and all of those 
are being reused. They are available as a service. You can really download them as a package. But we're always going to create a new malware that is continuously changing. And so rather than looking for the individual indicators, this is where the fundamental change is, what Vectra is trying to bring. And so we'd like to cover actually the unknown, and we also have been uh, getting the confirmations from the field uh, that that is where the problem lies. And so we would like to break the spiral of the unknown, you could say. And for that, we would like to focus on less alerts that will come. Still, we see a lot of data, but the automation will help to deliver more context as well as less but high fidelity detections. So this is a lot of marketing, you could say, but that is the cornerstone of 10 years of work, of which I will show you also a couple of the algorithms later on in the session so that you understand where it comes from. Because this is really what we need to do. We need to deliver an attack signal, and with that intelligence, you can automate the detection, the triage, the prioritization, and as such, the work that you have to do in your SOC. And it is all to arm the humans. You cannot expect, in real uh, uh, honesty, you cannot expect a tool to bring you an attack to surface. You will always have to do a lot of that work. We can help you, but the analyst is the cornerstone. And I hope that we always keep that in mind. And so to arm the uh, intelligence of the human persons, that is where we can accelerate a lot. And we will cover all of the items. The initial detection, where the SOC can be fit, fed with uh, uh, meaningful alerts, but also is going to be a lot of metadata, uh, and I have a surprise by the end, uh, additional tools available to do the hunting and the validation and the research. There's three areas that we kind of are covering in, in our overall story, which is first and above all, when you talk about an enterprise today, being that a large one, a small one, an, a, a governmental environment, a, a real business, there is always multiple areas of uh, technology being used. There is, of course, identity. More and more, this is centralized, like uh, the Active Directory or the, the, the single sign-on capabilities. You have, of course, a big footprint of SaaS, especially after COVID. M365 and Zoom and all of those have been growing quickly. There's been a big lift and shift from on-prem to IAS environments, AWS, Azure, GCP. But on top, we still have the traditional network as well. A lot of that is physically, but also virtually been scaling. And as such, it is not uh, possible today to say like, oh, we should just uh, install one thing there and another thing there, and then we try to bring it together. That is failing. That's what we have been doing all those years. That's where we have been building the seams, where we have been trying to build all those use cases, those correlation rules. And we always have to catch up. And there is no consistency. And yes, there is one point that in the entire, you could say, stack of technology in an enterprise, we do not cover, and that's the direct endpoint. We are a technology that is fully invisible in a network. We take just a network span port or a tap, or we use an API when it comes on cloud, but we see everything. But this also means we are not to be evaded. We are not going to be tested and then checked on what can we do to stop, for instance, that service. That's not going to be possible. But it also means that we don't see the reconnaissance, for instance, that could happen on an endpoint. And so we typically would always advise to have both a network as well as an endpoint coverage together, bring that in a SaaS, uh, in, a, in, in an overall probably SOAR capability so you can uh, actually have the holistic view. What we do is listen to EDR, for instance, to get information about endpoints so we can also bring meaningful names to the detections of the machines. And that is very much helping as well. So attack coverage is very important. But then there's also that signal clarity and the control that we need to do. And all of that can be used for instance by partners to build uh, a service around it, to manage it. We can talk about a TDR platform, so a threat detection response platform. And then of course there's an ecosystem, either something that is off the shelf, like the seams, the source of this world. But if you would be willing to build your own scripts and impl uh, um, applications to integrate with response technologies, being that NACs being that firewalls, it's all going to be available. So this is really an open capability that gives you input from where you can work. And I'm nearing in also really on, I thought I had stopped all of my applications, apparently not the <laughs> calendar application. Um, so what we'd really try to do is the, uh, the intelligence of the signal. And we have three forms of AI that we have been implementing. For about 10 years, we've been working on AI-driven detections. 
And what is the cornerstone of that is to think like an attacker. Rather than to look for an individual IOC based on either an IP or uh, a very specific foot fingerprint of a malware package or a file or itself. No, we're going to try to look at what is the entire cycle that an attacker has to do to get into a network. Right? We all know that the phishing is typically the first one or the malicious file that is being double-clicked, but then you land. Where do you land? Somewhere in the network on a machine. Is that close to the credentials or the data that you want to steal? Very unlikely. You will have to find your way there, right? It is very much like dropping a, para, a parachutist in Workfire after the lines, and he has to figure out, phone home, and, inf and tell uh, the, the command the intelligence of the field. That's all of the things that will happen here. So we also do a lot of research in understanding what that is, and rather than working on an indicator for a specific parameter, we will be looking at the behavior, right? A behavior of lateral movement, a behavior of reconnaissance. And these are typically well described already in MITRE. So we cover about 97% of the MITRE framework with all of the coverage that we do. But we have also been able to drive with the AI, and AI, of course, is a swear word. I know that as well. It's the data science and the machine learning we apply. Also, we have been able to do that on triaging, because even AI-driven detections are not false positive less, right? There is going to be some of those false positive or benign detections that you do not want to see because they're not dangerous because in the context of where they are used. And so for that, we've also been building that technology to start looking into finding that really unique detection and not one that is very suspicious, but is, over, is happening all over the place. You don't want the analyst to have to dry, triage them out in the interface continuously. There you can find, again, machine learning technologies, algorithms that can find the common components, bring them together, filter them out. But then last but not least, it's the driven prior, is prioritizing your detections. Of course, you can say, I've seen 20 scans on that host. Is that really dangerous? I guess not, because that could be your vulnerability scanner as well. But at the same time, if I do see also from that machine an SSL connection going out that is suspicious, right? could be very well a C2, and based on the pattern on the network, we kind of recognize that. We already have two phases of the attack kill chain. And then if on top of that, you start to see that that machine is starting to use user accounts that have higher privileges to destinations it never did before, now it starts to come together, right? So this is much more meaningful than to look into all the individual ones then now to say, okay, all these three correlated back to the same account or the same machine. Let's now bump that into the queue of the analyst so that he can do a proper investigation. And that is really where the prioritization will work. And what we are doing is to even give input or allow input from the analyst or the enterprise by, for instance, defining what are the critical assets in your environment. Put them in a group. And if something happens on those with all the same conditions as to another, but because of the priority of that account or machine, you will bump it higher. Or if you see that it's not just reconnaissance, but a, a, a primarily lateral movements with the command and control. So the danger itself is bigger. It will also bump in priority. And I will just give you one screenshot later on, just to give you an idea what this is. We're not going to do uh, a lot of uh, that more, but we try to give a lot of tools as well as results to the analysts. But then, of course, when you have found something, you need to do an act. You need to do something, you need to act on that. A lot of technology will now say, oh, we do this automatically. We will block the host. We will add a block rule in the network so that the user now is, or that machine is no longer dangerous. It doesn't work like that. Because first and above all, an attacker is, and I think you guys know that probably better than I do, is never going to have just one channel. He will have his backup connections, right? If one is killed, there is another. If there is one machine that's being killed, there is another, right? So if it is a persistent attack, it's just not possible to just kill one. You'll have to investigate, you'll have to do a proper action. And a proper action is to integrate with playbooks. And probably those playbooks either have been pre-built or you as a uh, team has been building these and would like to interact with the information from, for instance, such a tool, and then apply the responses that you would like to. So 
integrate investigation so you can really start looking into the metadata of all of the connections because that one single detection maybe was followed or pre uh, before that were other actions, so you would like to figure it out. You maybe want to automate the workflows, and then, of course, you would like to do a targeted response. Could be an account lockdown, but typically that's going to be part of your playbook. So I hope, checking the clock, indeed, I didn't take much more than 15 minutes to kind of in in introduce what the purpose is of Vectra. We do this for over 10 years. This is the only product or only platform we do. So this is the butter, the bread and the butter of our organization. How do we do it? Because that's the question always, of course. And I'm zooming in. So first and above all is, and let me see if I can maybe close this one because it's... There we go. So... This is the interface, for instance, that you would see. As I said, I'm not going to do a demo here, so I'm just going to give you just the idea where you have a response view, where you get a clarified or a prioritized, in this case, an account, which gives you information like, hey, this is the account, what data has happened, what was the rating, and for instance, the entity, so this, in this case, account could be a machine, is of medium importance, but because of all of the attack ratings, and the profile that has been assigned to it, and the velocity, so a lot of different steps that were happening at the same time, we bumped this one with the AI into the triage filter. Right? So now you can work on it, and we immediately give the indicators where you can now look into and what you can do. And then from there, you can even look into all of the surrounding information of what has this account been doing in this case in an M365? Has it been logging in multiple times? Has it had other detections? Was it changing exchange rules, etc.? So a lot of the questions you would ask yourself are kind of built in into an instant investigation workflow at once. So that is to help you to navigate all of those detections and prioritize and bring them together into one. And then in a tree of priority, you know what to work. So this is a clear, actionable list where you as an analyst log in, this is what I have to do today. And then you can have others that will then be, for instance, in the hunt page, other machines with detections, if you have time left, that you can start looking into. But how do we come to all those detections? As I said, over 10 years, and the prime components we have is security researchers and data scientists. Right? The security researchers are people, like a lot of you probably in the room, that have a lot of skills in figuring out uh, how maybe I could intrude, uh, what are maybe new tactics that I could use or procedures. And so they will really, really do all of that work and they will start to test it. They will build prototypes and if they succeed in breaching something and they can consistently do that, they will start to hand over that information to the data scientists because with that consistency that they approach and try to get, they have a behavior kind of approach. So. That is what the detection would like to focus on. We have detections that are in the product for over eight years already that have not been really uh, changed. So there is no updates, no custom things to do because we look at the behavior, the outcome, you could say, of a vulnerability that is being abused, not finding uh, the abuse of the vulnerability itself. There's other tools for that. And so with that, the data science will start to build a model and they will use, of course, algorithms for that. And now we come into the detection of the discussion about AI and what is AI. So machine learning data science, we are going to have a wild and a broad pattern of machine learning and algorithms available. So our data scientists live closely to Boston and have all mostly a PhD degree of the Boston University work really uh, on that uh, thing. And they will start analyzing what is the algorithm to use. And there is no free lunch. You cannot say, just going to use always a Bayesian model. It's not working like that, because you're not looking for the outlier. You're looking for not anomalous behavior, but suspicious behavior. So you need to tailor it. And that is exactly what we do here. So we test it, we apply it, and we go back to that research and that model and that prototype to see how well it is de being detected. You're welcome if you want. Um, so once we have um, all of those detections and we have validated it, it will start to be 
also productized, only then we would like to know what do we need to visualize, what do we need to tell the analysts based on all of those detections. So that's then the work of the designers on the UX. Only then we will start to put it out in test environments only before we do a full release. So in some cases, especially when it is a completely new model that's never been do done before, it could actually take one, sometimes two years before we really can productize this. So this is not just something you do between lunch and dinner. This is really taking an approach and also requires dedication from an organization because you have to allow to fail, right? You have to allow to fail mostly because there's only one uh, time that you will get close to a solution. And so once we have done that, and this is where you probably recognize the MITRE framework a little bit, we have, of course, models for a lot of the different phases. You see the command and control, we have the reconnaissance phase, the lateral and, of course, exfil phase. That is the, uh, you could say, the end game. Huh? Um, another question, by the way, just to take, to take a little uh, uh, side tour, I had in that uh, webinar earlier uh, this week was, what do you think, and that was a question to the audience, is the, the, the big, or what is, f where do you have the most fear from? From DDoS, from a data leak, from phishing, from ransomware, or from an APT, or other. No one took other, so that was good, right? But the majority took ransomware. And for me, that was an eye-opener, because if that is your fear, then you're late, late, late in your reaction, because that's the end game, that is the exfil, that is the, the double extortion, maybe. All the work that the attacker had to do, you have left un untouched. That phishing email is the start of the campaign, Right? That DDoS is maybe the smoke mirror that was put up to get into your network, right? But the APT that only got like 15%, I think, of the votes, that is the real threat. And it doesn't have to be a state-sponsored uh, state, uh, uh, problem. Yeah? It could also be really uh, the traditional attackers just looking for the money. But there is always an objective, and that is, I think, something you all know, but a lot of the people we talk to not always know, there is an objective for an attacker. He is, he's not doing that out of fun. Of course, <laughs> there is some fun for some, I guess, but they're money-driven typically, or they're, it's espionage. It's as simple as that, right? And that doesn't happen overnight. So that is why all of these steps matter, and that you do have to have a, a holistic coverage for that. And so, in the remainder of the session, what I'd like to do is to actually hoover in or zoom in on the hidden HTTPS tunnel and PAA, like we call it, privilege anomaly. And I'd like to give you a little bit of an idea on what is the work that we have done, what is the result of uh, those detections coming out. So when we look at the HTTPS tunnel model or beacon model, right, there is, of, look, of course, a lot, a lot of tools that exist. I gave a few already earlier, how you have uh, Cobalt Strike, but there's so many others that could be used, could be custom tunnels, could be with front-ending, uh, uh, domain front-ending to, to try to hide the real destinations more. Typically, you would like to, to use certificates as an attacker that are long existing, so that you're not giving the chances to attackers or uh, uh, defenders that just look for newly created or short-living certificates. That's, that's way too easy. So there's a lot of work that goes in and to, to make it actually go under the radar. And so just looking for a match on an IP or a URL is not working in the detection phase. It works well when an attack is known and the threat intel is being share, shared. And then it makes a lot of sense. Okay, now we know this attack campaign is ongoing. These are the destinations they use. We have this fingerprint. And if you're lucky and you have your metadata or your PCAP information available, you can go back in time and try to find it. But that could be too late, right? So this is what we have been embarking on, is to try to find a technology that can find a tunnel before it is known and so that you can actually find it. And what we do is we've been feeding data. I think you all know AI or machine learning. Data science is just big data. Agreed? Yes, so it's big data. You need compute, and we use a, a lot of GPU for that uh, because that is really where you can accelerate on that. And what we have done is we have been implementing the LSTM, the deep learning uh, recurrent rural, rural networks. And why this type of network and uh, in inspection for the tunnel? Because you need to have a loop. You have to have a feedback loop coming back. 
right? So we're going to look and find unique patterns, but at the same time, we're going to see if they're recurring. And that is something that requires data science. This is not something you can do with a Bayesian model, so there is a well-known, uh, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a good reason why uh, we have uh, taken this. But on top of that, we're also adding the time series. So maybe one step back I need to do is when you look at where can you find information to analyze, right? It's either log files that you get over an API or maybe via a seam, or it is the raw network data. The raw network data is where you can, where can you find it on a span or a tab or a packet broker typically. But if you would be storing all of that in rolling PCAP, that is where lots of problems have existed in the past. It's just too much. It's too cumbersome to search and to use. So what we have decided is to actually immediately translate the data that we collect on the network, either on one or multiple sensors, into a metadata. And we kind of base that on the Zeek, bro -Zeek format, but we have extended it with additional data. And so you could say that uh, uh, um, patch of data that is kind of reducing the original data to maybe 2.5% of the original size, is being recorded and centralized and stored there. And there we apply the searches on. So that's what I quickly needed to explain. Because we say it is indeed based on Brozik, but it is much more enhanced than what that is. And so with all of this work, what now can happen is that we are starting to find the commonalities, but also uh, the, the deviations uh, from the patterns. And so when you go back to a very simple drawing board and you try to draw how does a web connection look like on the wire, it's actually as simple as this. You have, of course, the time. You have typically the send. This is going in a browser, typing URL. You click go, right? You send a query. That is typically not that much data, but it gives you a return, and that data is going to be sent back, and that's typically more than what you have been requesting. So very simple and will be quite visible on the network. This is how a beacon would look like. Again, very simplified but you immediately start to see the differences, right? Rather than seeing always the request to be less than the response, we start to see spikes the other way around. We start to see that actually the request, what we think is the request, is actually higher. And yes, it is the request, but via the C2. And so now the responses are going to come after the, uh, the request, and we see that the response is actually going out, in this case, bigger than what we normally would see from web traffic. And we can even see the timelines, and that's why that time series is so important to take into account. And so now we can start to map it to the C2, where we see an attacker comment. There's no need to do any decryption, because first, <laughs> you will not be able, typically, to intercept that. Um, it's custom encryption, probably pinning, so there is no decryption capability. So you need to look at the, the, the telemetry, and then we start to also see, of course, the infected result or the response of that uh, query back out. So this is the analysis of what could happen on the wire. And so what we have implemented with this type of detection is the hidden HTTPS detection. So we first and above all can see that this is now correlated to a machine. We give you the latest IP address of that machine. We give you a summary of what was detected, even an infographic of how it would look like. But then on top, you also have the timeline. You will start to see where it was going to, and we immediately have been helping you with the JA3JA3S hash. Known to you, the hashes? Yes, I guess so. So quite unique. If it is unique, very <laughs> important to look into. If it is a common JA3 fingerprint, then you probably have a regular browser. And then we have looked at the behavior of the tunnel, and then we can say, this is multiple short TCP sessions, abnormal beacon. So now you have all of that information at hand at once to give a quick analysis. You can search this in your databases, and now you can start to look on additional detections that come with that machine in order to validate it, right? And then on top, we also have the investigate incognito recall capability. That means recall is just a data lake where all that metadata is stored now you can go apply your Lucene queries and have results on everything you want to know because a fingerprint of every connection is there. Regular connect 
Uh, like you know, uh, iSession, we call that, is there for every single port. And then for about up to 15, 16 different metadata uh, flows, going like LDAP, uh, being SSL, uh, X509, DNS, uh, all of these, we have additional, sometimes up to about 100 attributes that are being collected and available in that data feed. So that is where you can then start to look for uh, additional information. Another component where we have spent a significant amount of time in the research department is on what is it that makes, for instance, the detection of privilege abuse so different. So the tunnel is one, that's eh, one part of your attack kill chain. Then you have your reconnaissance, very simple typically to find eh, with the port scans, the sweeps and all of these, the brute forces. There you don't need really a lot of logic, of course it's being covered, but that's not uh, where you can make a difference. But then, when you can find that credential, you found the right machine, you applied Mimic Cats and you could read the memory and you found your credential. And it turns out to be an administrative credential. You've been able to validate that with your LDAP queries that that credential indeed does have permissions because it's part of this and this and this group. And you have found the machine that probably is very interesting with that privilege. And now you would like to start using that. And when you would use that, there is no IAM or whatever uh, privilege detection capability that is going to say, hey, suspicious, because the credential, credential is real, it is known in that environment, and has been used internally. Right? And that is the problem of PAM, uh, privilege access management. You typically give the biggest uh, privilege to a user uh, based on his role, but technically, you probably maybe only use that once or twice a year. So that's one thing you can work on. Reduce the privilege you give and have your uh, exceptions uh, to use. But this is also, of course, where the attacker is going after, finding that privilege. So we will look at observed privilege. So we will, because we see all the connections, we will start to map and learn what are the different accounts, what are the different services and machines, and what is the interaction with these. And the combination of those that is happening all the time is probably not dangerous at all, at all. Because a lot of people, a lot of destinations, right, with the same, so this is probably file sharing internally. If it then starts to become a little bit more unique by, for instance, just one user or one service to only a few destinations, the, the, the fewer connections, the fewer combinations, most likely the higher the privilege. And this is what we call observed privilege. And with observed privilege, we can now work towards building again with the data science clusters. Clusters of devices and or users that behave similarly. Right? And once we then have that, and we have been continuously monitoring that over time, it is going to be possible to see that guy or girl or service or whatever that suddenly is coming out of the cluster and is moving into another one. That should not happen. It could be, right? It's not because this happens that there is an attack. It could be clearly <laughs> inappropriate use. It could be abuse internally, right? Without a real attack. But it also could be an indicator to an attack. So if you would just focus only on this, you might have a lot of work again. But if you start to see this one in combination with other phases of the attack, it starts to make much more sense. And that, again, is why we work on things like unusual service from host. So, yes, it's unusual. We are not saying it is a, a dangerous combination. Because, again, it could be an outlier, could be used. But now you know what to look for. It's the service from that host which seems to be odd. But it also could be all three, right? Unusual host or unusual trio. That the complete combination of machine service and account uh, are quite weird. And this, for instance, is something we have seen with our customers that were uh, had uh, the technology deployed when the SolarWinds supply chain attack came in. Right? You know what, what happened there, I'm not going to explain that again. And so it came in with an update. But of course what happened is the backdoor was there and the backdoor allowed access if used. It was not because the backdoor was established that you were hacked, but if the tag was using it, he came on that machine. And then he could probably find an account more quickly there. 
And if then that account, the service account on Orion, was being used on a different machine, that was exactly what we started to see in our technology. That service was never actually used outside of that context, and then we saw it. Pam was not saying anything because that service had the rights. And that's the difference between the privileged access and the observed privilege. So with these, and on top we have same developments on the cloud with the Azure AD privileges eh, that we monitor, we have a complete coverage of accounts internally, accounts in SaaS, and uh, accounts in uh, Azure AD, for instance. And so when we would have a detection, again, very similar, now you see a view where not the machine is being used, but an account. Again, we have the same type of information, which again have the same timeline. But in this case, because it's an unusual, you see here the triangle with the account name, the machine, and the service. But we also on top tell you it's unusual for that service actually, uh, or for that account to have, and that machine to have the service listed, right? And it's unusual for the host to have uh, uh, access to that service. So that is what we do, and we tell you on top, what we learned over time is that it actually should be like this. Again, this is an indicator, this is uh, information that is being fed into the different models by the different detections coming along on the same machine or account. Now the analyst can take a much more powerful decision on what to do next. So we have the baseline, we have the indicators, and uh, from here we can work. So we hope that this is giving you an idea about the data science. Um, I'm about to wrap up. And as I said, there's maybe one little thing, maybe two. One more thing is what we often see is that um, the validations, and I'm not looking at you, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you do better, but a lot of our customers are not validating their defense with the right tests. The simplest I can explain that is like if you buy a bulletproof vest that you wear, that's probably going to be robust against a bullet coming from a handgun, right? And if that is what you would like to protect again, then it's probably yeah, not a lot. But that is also often what we now see that it's perceived to be the full defense line and they test it only with the bullet. But the attack, the APT is not coming in with the bullet, it's a precision weapon and it just goes through it. So you need to test your capabilities as well. And there's not going to lecture here. I just want to let you know what we always talk about to our customers. If you want to test it, also replicate the C2. And just don't replicate the beacon. Use the C2. Because that is really what the attacker also will have to do. We often see that tests, pen tests that are done, they create a lot of beacons, but they're not using the beacon. So the idea is you should find the beacon. But if you work on behavior capabilities, you're not going to look for the initial beacon, you're going to use for, you look for the abuse of a beacon to be used as a command and control. So that's one way. And then the internal uh, really do the port scans, but also go into more than that. Do the RPC and the LDAP recons, and on top of that, if you're going to do an exfiltration, not just one file. You typically would like to find multiple files internally, bring them back to the machine that is on the C2, which is going to typically the, the port going out. So make it as realistic as possible. That's the advice that we give to our customers, because this is the way you need to test also such uh, capabilities. And then you're now going to maybe smile with me. It's like he's been talking about 30, about 30 minutes about AI and how and what you need to do to reduce the number of alerts and uh, and to make sure that the analysts can take a, a well uh, a thought decision. After 10 years, but because of the pressure of all of our big accounts, we are also going to address the IDS use cases. And with the IDS use cases, I typically call out the snorts and the suricatas of this world, right? A lot of our bigger customers, especially bigger customers, still do use them and still don't want to let go on them. They have the AI now, but they're Prime belief is still that they have to exchange information between their uh, between uh, different divisions and maybe also their partners. And so we have now looked into it and identified about four use cases. You don't need to read it all. I'm just quickly saying uh, the CSERT use cases where there is also the compliance requirement. We have relations with vendors and other customers, and we need to be able to quickly scan for CVEs, and we have the, uh, the, the obligation to do so. 
Without, with, you cannot do that with Vector because that's not what the goal is of an AI, right? But you might have that compliance use case. So why not uh, bring that back into one solution? The same for the threat hunting. Maybe you get indeed that intelligence of a new threat. You want to look for it. Or you want to extend coverage. A lot of the times there is some signature coverage on the firewall parameter, being that either between the different uh, divisions or on the parameter. Or you would like to have a second opinion. Maybe you want to have a, th a, th a second or even maybe a third uh, capability that is going to look uh, for that information. And so what are we doing in this quarter actually is Within our sensors, which are really pro pro uh, processing all the data, right? the intelligence happens in the brain. I'm not going to spend too much time on that right now. But the sensor is picking in or taking in all that data. As I explained earlier, is creating metadata from that. And that metadata is then sent centrally. We have now carved out dedicated resources on those machines, threads, that will not impact the original capability and will be reserved to Suricata. So if you have your ET Open Pro or ET, ET Pro Open or your Pro or your custom uh, rules files, um, yes, I started uh, <laughs> 20 minutes late. Uh, so I'm finishing indeed. Uh, we, you can now uh, use these to go uh, into the platform uh, and apply all of that uh, at once. So it's a reduction and uh, a consolidation of capabilities. And then the last uh, slide here. We do have also the opportunity for you to experience what is that tool we use? What is that detect interface? What is that data lake? And how can you use Lucent queries, etc.? So at 4, which is uh, not too far away now, we'll have actually a blue team capture the flag exercise in the boardroom. It will take you about one and a half hours. Uh, you'll be able to use your laptops to log in. And then uh, uh, we have, of course, uh, a prize for the winner. So, be welcome in, uh, in a little over half an hour. Thank you, and uh, yeah, we look forward to talk to you soon.